morning? I mean, this afternoon? It's 2.24 is where we're going to start. We have come into his house. Would you bow with me for just a moment? Lord, we stand in your presence tonight. And, and Lord, we want to praise you for who you are. We want to praise you for what you have done for us. Lord, we want to praise you for what you're doing in our lives and, and how you're speaking into our lives, Lord. Lord, we want to praise you for the purpose, God, that you have for us and that your will that is sovereign that you have over our lives as individuals, as families, as a church family. And Lord, tonight, we want to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, we, we want to forget about ourselves. We want to realize that worship is not about us. It's about you who you are and what you want to do in us and through us so that we can be vessels that are obedient, that trust you, that bring you glory and fulfilling your purposes. And tonight is your church, Lord. We want to lift up our praise tonight. Lord, because when you revive our hearts, when we experience and encounter you, Lord, Praise flows from our souls unto your throne as we exalt you and as we lift you up. As we stand in God's presence tonight, I want you to, to think of one aspect of God's nature, God's character that you praise Him for. It may be love, it may be grace, it may be mercy, faithfulness, sovereignty. Holiness, righteousness, justice. I want you to think of, of one eternal attribute of our holy, wonderful God. And I want you to put it in the forefront of your mind. When you focus on that attribute and you have that attribute, would you just say amen with me? In just a few moments, this is what we're going to do. I, I want to read this psalm. And see, David understood that the, the power, the psalmist understood the power of praise in, in our worship. And, and I'm going to read this psalm. And as we conclude reading this psalm, I'm going to say, I praise you for, God, we praise you for, and I want you, with your best voice of praise, to, to just shout out that attribute to God.
Praise the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all our sins, who heals all our diseases, who redeems our life from the pit and crowns us with love and compassion, who satisfies our desires with good things so that our youth is renewed like the eagles. Let's give God our praise tonight. God, we praise you for your forgiveness. We love you, God. Be glorified in this place tonight in every way, and your will be done in every heart. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Our next hymn will be our offertory hymn, and we'll, it's 391. Sweet, sweet spirit. We'll sing through it. Heavenly Father, Lord, just so thankful to come into your house and to worship you, Father. We thank you for these past few days, dear Father. Thank you for your presence here in our hearts and our minds and in this place, dear Father. Lord, we just uh, love you and thank you for all that. And Lord, I just pray that you just lead God and direct us and open our hearts as we continue through the service, dear Father, Lord, today, dear Father. Lord, just open our hearts and minds, Lord, to hear from you uh, through music and through, through uh, your word, dear Father, Lord. Just, uh, Lord, may we just live a better life in you. Just lead God and direct us 
Lord, just thank you for this time uh, that we can give to your kingdom, your Father, Lord, and pray that the gift that is given, Lord, be, be glorified to, to you and, and, and uplifting to your kingdom, your Father, Lord. Lord, just go with us and lead God and direct us in everything we do and say that we're glorifying your name today, your Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs> Michelle. Well, Brother David, I violated the first rule of singing, and I ate too much, so so if I fall out, uh, the youth will drag me over to the side, and the pulpit's yours, so, um, but uh, you know, the first song we sang this morning for the special was fairly somber, and hopefully through revival, you know, the Lord's breaking you, He's tearing you down, and then when you get to the end, hopefully we've been all broken, we've been changed, and then we're celebrating, right? So when we leave and we go into this world, we put people around us to see that we've been changed because we're celebrating. So that's what this song is about. There you go. I count on one thing, the same God who never fails. He will not fail me now. He will not fail me now. And in the waiting, yeah. The same God who's never late. He's working all things out. He's working all things out. So, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley.
I don't know, brother. If you're full from the jambalaya, you better keep on eating that jambalaya. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know, Chad pulls this up, and I push it back. Uh, he's going to tell me, man, quit fooling with my wife. Aren't you glad that we serve a holy God? Not a counterfeit God, right? He's the real deal. I hope you're not serving a counterfeit God. Here's the deal. There's a lot of counterfeit things in life. And I hope that you've taken revival, and this isn't a counterfeit revival for you. For you've learned, God showed you something that's going to change your life. Night before last, I was looking online, and this guy I know put a, a post up and said, hey, I'm moving, and I've got these things for sale. Well, some things caught our eye, and I asked my wife, I said, you know, look at these things. So I began to message, and we began to talk back and forth, and, and it got down to the point to where uh, he said, you, ought to, you need to send some money and, and, and put out a deposit, and I won't talk to anybody else about it. Well, I'm not thinking, I'm thinking I know this guy. Well, then all of a sudden, something just didn't click. Last night, uh, we got home late, and uh, I, met, I messaged, and he didn't message me back. And so I put my phone on silent, because if I get woke up at night, uh, my mind goes to running. And uh, I, so I put it on silent last night. Got up this morning, and, and it said, I was busy last night. Um, get with you later. And uh, then, then he put a question mark, huh? And, and, and so I, I, something just didn't sound right. So I began to message him, and I realized that he had been to Centerpoint Church. And uh, so I called the pastor, and I said, look, you know so-and-so? He said, yeah. I said, is he moving? And he said, no. He said, why? I said, because there's a, a post that he's moving, and there's some things for sale online. And he said, no, it's a, it's a hack. And, uh, and you know, I, I said, God, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for just, just letting me know, because I'd already figured it out. And then I, the guy sent me the link to his PayPal, and I looked him up, and he actually used his real name, I think, because he come up in Kenya. He was in Kenya. And if I'd have clicked on it and he wanted to do the PayPal account over there, I would have got in trouble with that, you know? So you think about the counterfeits in life. Also, I don't know how many of you have gotten a letter. I got a letter this, uh, this last week, and, and it's usually from another state, and it says, hey, we know you got some land in Lincoln County, and we'd like to buy your land for, and they put an amount on there, and that amount is very, very low. And, and so you think about the counterfeits. I told my sister, I said, can you believe that they would offer that amount of money for the amount of land that we have? And I said, what, what's sad about it is people see it, and they take it. And, and that's what happens in life. There's a lot of counterfeits out there, and we need the wisdom of God. We need God to pour into our life. And let God just uh, speak. He'll protect us. That's exactly what God did for us uh, in, in just the moment. And I praise the Lord that we serve a God who's real. And I ask you tonight, I pray that you're serving the real God. You're not serving some counterfeit God that you've created. You're not serving some idol that you put in place in your life. Somebody's saying, do we really have idol worship today? Here's the deal. You got anything in your life that comes before God? There's your idol. There's your idol. And, I, and you need to sacrifice that idol and get right with the Lord. Sacrifice that thought in your life and get right with the Lord. That's what revival's all about. And you think about what God really wants to do in our life. And here's the deal. We're going to look at the first revival tonight. Just going to kind of tie it together. If you've been here Friday uh, night, Saturday morning, su Saturday night, Sunday morning, you're probably not going to hear a whole lot new tonight. Because I just want to challenge you, and we're going to do something at the end uh, that I think it'll be great uh, for you and for friendship, and uh, just looking for the power of God and what he wants to do. So turn with me to Acts chapter 2 tonight. You'll be able to hold Acts chapter 2, and we're going to go over to Hebrews 10. But when you begin to think about it, I've told you about your logo. It caught my eye the first uh, when we come in on Friday, and I begin to talk to Brother Chad about it. Acts 1 8 is one of my favorite verses. Uh, my life verse is actually Isaiah 40, 31, but Acts 1, 8 has become so dear to me. Uh, and, and I believe that you and I have missed out on that in so many ways because when we talk about Acts 1, 8, the Word of God says that we receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, and then we shall be witnesses. We will be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And so if we're not careful, we'll box in Jerusalem. 
and we never move to Judea, and we never move to Samaria, and we certainly never go to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so God has challenged us as people to be a part of all of that, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. The church, no matter how small, can do that. And so I want to just encourage you in that. Don't cut, you, don't cut yourself short uh, because you think, well, I'm a small church, or I'm this, or I'm that. Remember what we said, don't tell God I can't. When the door opens, walk through it. Watch what God will do. I'm telling you, God's looking for our obedience. He'll bless us in the midst of that obedience, and we'll be able to walk in a way like we've never walked before. So you think tonight about uh, Acts chapter 2. God created us to live in community. Here's, let, me, let me just say a word. I've been talking to men some this week. Guys are notorious for living in isolation. I want to ask you guys right now, Tonight, do you have some guys in your life, men, do you have men close in your life that you can go to and talk to about anything and everything? And you know they love you, and you know they're going to speak truth in your life. Most guys don't have that. Most guys don't have it. Pastors, we're, 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 we're notorious for isolating ourselves. We, 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 we tend to think, well, I don't want somebody else to know my problems, my issues. I'm telling you, we need to get free of that. And we need those guys around us that can breathe into our life and speak truth. Guys, I want to tell you tonight, you need somebody in your life. If you're not in a small group, you need to get in one. If you don't know what to do, ask your pastor about it, create one, and get it started. You need to be in that group. You know, I talk to them about ladies all the time. The ladies are good at being groups. I'm telling you, none of you need to get up and go to the bathroom because all the ladies will go with you, right? The guys ain't going to do that. You can laugh. It's okay. Laugh. The ladies go in a group. If one of, those, one of these girls go, you'll all be gone. You're good at groups. Guys are not, right? Guys are not. I mean, y'all look down the road and say, hey, you need to go? Yep, we go. Guys don't do that. Guys, we need to be in groups. We need to be in men. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that in just a moment. And you think about what the Lord Jesus did and did through the Word of God and how he brought the disciples together. And, and you know, God spoke so much into their life. You do realize that in the 40 days following the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. In those 40 days, he dealt with the disciples in ways that he didn't deal with them when he was alive and walking with them. You ever thought about that? What happened in the midst of the disciples' lives? They argued. Who was the greatest? <laughs> Who's the greatest among you? I'm greater than him. I'm better than him. They argued. They did all kinds of stuff. Peter denied him. Look at their life. But in those 40 days when Jesus was resurrected to the ascension, Look at what happened. He breathed in their life. He taught them more in those 40 days. They took hold of the 40 days and what he taught them, and then they lived it. And he told them to wait. He told them to stay in Jerusalem. What did he tell them to wait for? Somebody tell me. The Holy Spirit of God. Thank you, Aubrey. He told them to wait. Because here's the deal. You try to do it in your own strength, you won't make it. They couldn't live it. They couldn't make it. And he told them to wait for the power of the Holy Spirit of God to come up on their life. And then when it did come up on their life, it energized them. And that's where you and I are in revival. When we think about a movement of God and what he really wants to do in our life, that we live in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. So follow along with me tonight um, in Scripture, in, in um, chapter 2 there, beginning in verse 37. See if I can get these things out of this pocket. I should have already done had them out. My bad. Verse 37. Now, when they heard this, now think about what was taking place. Peter was preaching, and I'm telling you, he was telling them about, he was shucking the corn, as the old preacher was saying, and he was telling them about the Lord Jesus Christ. And he got down to this, and he said, they heard this, and listen to what happened. They were pierced. I mean, they were right there. They, I mean, it, was, it pricked their heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent. Remember what we've been talking about. Clean mind. Turn and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and all who are far off. Why is that in there? Can somebody tell me why that's in there? Because it goes beyond the Jews at that point. It goes to the Gentiles. It goes that are far off. Those that are far off, it's a gospel that says, whosoever will may come. Surrender to the Lord Jesus, as the Lord our God shall call to himself. Verse 40, and many other words be solemnly testified. And he kept on exhorting them, saying, be saved from, listen, perverse this perverse generation. 
So then those who received his word were baptized. And here we go, first revival. Remember just a few times, uh, um, verses ago, we were at 120 people, right? 120 disciples. Look what happened. Then they received the word and baptized, and they were added about 3,000 souls. Wow. 3,000. Amazing revival right there. And they, here, here, here's the results. Don't miss this, because this is where we need to be. And after all that, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, breaking of bread, and to prayer. And then here we go. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. You want to know one of the issues today in the, in the church? We've lost the sense of awe. We've lost the awe of God. We're in the danger of recognizing who God is and the power of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. We've lost that awe. And they kept feeling that sense of awe. They saw it. And many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all of those who had believed were together. And they had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing with them all. Tell me about revival. There it is. That anyone had need. And day by day, continuing, here we go, one accord, one mind, in the temple, breaking bread, house to house, taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And look what was happening as a result of their obedience, as a result of a movement of God, and a result of revival. The Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. What an amazing passage when you look at that and you think about revival and what God wants to do. Now, let me just take you on over to Hebrews real quick. I was going to do it a little bit later, but let me take you there. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Hebrews 10, 19, look what it says. Since therefore, brethren, we, we, uh, we have confidence to enter the holy place. We talked about that this morning. By the blood of Jesus, under the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil. That is his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without waving. There's your revival. For he who promises faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate, how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our assembling of together as in the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see this day drawing near. The power of God, the results of revival. There it is in Scripture and what takes place. Why well, challenge you? Invite somebody. Encourage somebody. Pray for those names that you put on that prayer card on Friday night. Don't stop tonight. Lord, look in this week. Pray for them. Go to them. Speak to them. Invite them and encourage them. Let's go to the Lord. Father, I pray this morning, this evening. God, for a mighty move of God. God, I pray that you'd give us the energy, God, to just serve you, Lord. And, and God, keep us uh, alive in you, Lord, and that we hear the word of God and we live the word of God and we understand in the power of the Holy Spirit what you want to do. God, I thank you that you're not counterfeit, that you're real and you're holy. And God, you speak into our life. God, I pray, thanking you for this weekend. And God, I pray that nothing ends tonight, but God, it just elevates it goes to a different level. And God, we hear uh, tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday and the days after, God, of what you're doing in this place, in this community, in this family of God. God, that you may get all the glory. God, all the glory in Christ's name. Amen and amen. What a message. When we think about today's church, what a message. Uh, you go in Ecclesiastes and you can read there. In Ecclesiastes 4, that the cord of three strands is not easily broken. I'm telling you, we need to be in community, that you and I need to be living together. We need men to come together. I told you the other night that I believe if men get their lives right, we'll see revival in America like we've never seen before, where we've seen men. We'll see a great awakening of old that have come alive if men would just understand that we need to be together, and we need to be the men that God has called us to be. At the same time, we know that divided we stand, united, I mean, uh, united we stand, and divided we fall. And we come from all walks of life, every one of us. We look different, we act different. My, my dad used to say, we're all cut from different cloths, and we really are. We have different attitudes and all that, but isn't it the beauty of God when he takes us in our, and brings us in unity? I told you, uh, 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 one of the services, we don't have to be uniform, but God wants us to be in unity. And how beautiful it is when we think about red, yellow, black, and white. They're all precious in his sight. 
Praise the Lord for a movement of God and, and what God really wants to do. And we're better together. I hope you believe that. Let me just ask you, if you believe that, would you just say amen? Man, I'm telling you, we're better together. And, and I just want to build on that for a few moments tonight. I want you to think, because here's the deal. We have people in churches that have been there for a long time, but they've never matured in their faith. They're sitting where, where they were when they came to the Lord Jesus Christ, and there's never been a movement. They've never got excited. They've never got involved uh, really to the extent that God wants them to. And listen, God wants to extend your potential. God wants you to reach your potential in Jesus Christ. That's why it's important for you to say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, I'll do it. Don't, don't, don't say, uh, well, I need to go pray about that. Remember what I told you this morning. You ought to be prayed up walking with the Lord. And when somebody comes and a spiritual authority figure comes and said, hey, I think you'd be great at this. Would you take it? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I, I can't. God, in your power, I'll do it. Maybe you're that individual that just needs to grow in the Lord. Your faith needs to expand. And you learn to walk with the Lord Jesus. And the world in here and the world out there needs to see the church being the church. Needs to see you and I as believers doing what God has called us to do. And then when you look at the account that we've shared tonight, where does it all begin? It begins what we've been talking about all weekend, the relationship with Jesus Christ. I still believe that somebody in this building tonight, you're trying to do life on your own. You're trying to just make it happen and... And you're just, uh, I, I spent all afternoon, Chad said, you get some rest. No, I didn't get any rest. I'll just be honest with you. My wife would tell you, I went in the back bedroom, and I sit back there, and I read, and I, I just prayed, and I said, God, somebody's holding out. Somebody's holding out. And I want more than anything to see you get free in the Lord, to get free in Jesus. The world wants to hold you in bondage. Man, let, let go and let God and connect with the Lord Jesus like you never have before. Look at Acts chapter 2 and, and, and realize that God wants you to just sell out to him, to give it all up and just let him be God. Let the power of God reign in your life. Watch what he'll do. Let the Holy Spirit of God just move the paracletos that God has sent us, the comforter, the guide, the power of conviction. Life change, God's forgiveness, encouragement, being genuine, living in the power and the baptism of the Holy Spirit of God. I'm going to ask you tonight, how do you know you're saved? I'll, I'll just give you a scripture or, or a passage. If you're, if you're struggling, here's the deal. All of us at some point in time probably struggle with our salvation. God, am I really saved? God, am I walking where I need to walk? Where do you go when that happens? First John. Go read 1 John, and you'll find out real quick where you stand with the Lord. Go, I wish I could take you there tonight. I don't have time to do it. But you go take 1 John, and you read it. But how do you know, listen, how do you know that you know that you know that you know you're saved? It's because of a transformed life. It's because of your mind. It's because of your priorities. All of that changes. I tell people this. Before the Lord Jesus Christ comes in your life, you got morals. You've been taught right. You, you know right from wrong, but I'm telling you, after you get the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit comes in the holy temple of your life, then you got the morals on steroids. It's a big deal. You got the Holy Spirit of God. It's not on your conscience anymore. I'm telling you, God's speaking directly into your life. There's some discernment going on in your life. And you find out that repentance is real, and you begin to understand what we're talking about when we talk about full repentance of turning and the change of mind. Really looking at what God wants to do. I had a man, I, may, I don't think I've shared it, but I had a, a young couple. And uh, I, they, they moved to Temple, where I used to pastor. And they were from the Northeast, they were a military couple, and, and, and they were moving to Jackson County. And uh, I had the opportunity to talk to her first because he was still up in Norfolk, Virginia. And I began to talk to her, and she said, uh, Pastor Dave said, I hadn't been a Christian very long, and she began to tell me about the smorgasbord of life. I mean, they'd been involved in all kinds of religions. Remember what we said, religion doesn't save you? The relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ does. And she said, I found Jesus about a year and a half ago. She said, I, I won't tell you what denomination, but she said, I was reading, and God said, you know, this is just empty. This is all religion. And she said, I read some more, and I read some more, and the Holy Spirit of God began to work in my life, and I found a church to go to, and, and I went and I talked to them, and they told me how to be saved, and I gave my life to Jesus. Man, I'm telling you, she's bright. My wife will tell you. She is, uh, she's amazing. It's a fresh 
You know, there's people when you get around them, it's just like a fresh breath of air. Her energy, she was a new Christian. Young mom, two kids, full of energy. Husband up on the East Coast. They had a farm, got pigs, building fence, running a tractor. Uh, she was some kind of a, a mechanic in, in the military. I mean, just an amazing lady. Then her husband got there in April. And, uh, and they had been there several weeks, and I had been talking to him. And uh, one Sunday morning, they come down front. And they said, hey, pastor, we want to join the church. We feel like God wants us to be here. And I began to talk to them, and I said, uh, Alex, I know about your faith. We've talked about it. She said, yes, sir. I said, but what about you, James? What, what about you? And he began to tell me. He said, well, I've always known God. I said, really? He said, God's always known about me. God's always been involved in my life. And, and we just began to talk a little bit. And I knew about the smorgasbord. And we got down to it. I let it go for a few minutes. I said, James, you really need Jesus, don't you? And he said, yes, sir, I do. You want to tell, I want to tell you what one of the blessings is as a pastor. When you see that little mama, that wife, lead her husband to Christ right there in front of the church, <laughs> and you see big old tears dwell up and him he pray and give his life to Jesus, that's the blessing of a pastor. That's the blessing of seeing the fruits of God at work. And, and that couple's involved, and they're moving, and they're just, just a fresh breath of air. Guys, listen, don't miss it. Don't think you're a wimp because you're a, a Christian because you give your life to Jesus. It's the greatest decision you'll ever make. It's the greatest gift you can give to your family. You men in here tonight, if you're not living where God wants you to live, the greatest gift you can give to your family is get it right. Get it right. Sell out to the Lord Jesus Christ. Do what he wants you to do in your life. That relationship becomes the most important relationship in your life. Your wife will have a different husband. Your kids will have a different dad. Your grandkids will have a different, a different granddad. And the same thing for you ladies. You follow through with believers' baptism, and you watch what God does, and you begin to serve the Lord. I mean, you get wholeheartedly involved. Just, just come. I mean, this lady I'm talking about, she, she came, and she wasn't even a member yet, and she stopped me on her first Sunday. She said, Pastor, I don't know how I can get involved. But she said, will you let me be involved in some things? I said, you sure can. I said, there's our children's minister right there. Go going up. Go get involved with her. Go find out how to serve. And I'm going to tell you something. Here's our issues. And I guarantee you it's an issue here just like it is in some of our other churches. You get somebody that walks in the door back there. We'll say hi to them. We'll love on them. But if we're not careful... We'll let them be isolated because I guarantee you, how many of you tonight are sitting in the same pew, almost the same seat that you sit every service? Let me see your hand. Don't tell no story. You'll be on the altar in a little bit. You see there? Now, what if somebody comes in that, that's a guest? I told our people this all the time because we had the same issue, and we let them sit there by themselves instead of us moving to them because we don't want to get out of our spot. Praise God, I hope somebody walk in and sit in your spot. You don't come up and go. You got my spot. Can you move over here? Man, alive. I hope that never happens. That's happened to me. I hope you wouldn't do that. But it's a dangerous place to be. So right, here's the deal, revival. I want God to open your eyes. We sang this morning, God, open the eyes of my heart, God. Get your physical eyes open. Begin to look for somebody. Remember, you're supposed to be calling. You're supposed to be inviting. You're supposed to be going. Make sure that you welcome them. Love on them. Man, there's some hurting people out there. There's some folks that desperate. There's somebody in here. I'm so glad they're here. I know them personally. They just need people to love on them. And I'm telling you, folks, we got people that are hurting all around us. They just need people to love on them. Make sure you reach out to those. Get outside your comfort zone. Move around. I mean, Brother Chad's probably going to get ready to call on somebody to pray, and he knows where you're sitting. He don't even look at you there. He just calls. He's assuming you're there because he sees somebody. Get over there somewhere. Go hide somewhere else. Play, play a Christian basket turnover. <laughs> get somewhere. And we're better together in the very presence of God. Let me take a step further. When you look at real revival, not only are we just better together with Jesus, but here we go. 
we're better together growing and maturing with one another. Men and men, women and women, couples and couples. The Bible tells us very easily that as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. So one woman sharpens another. I'm so thankful that you've got small groups. I heard your pastor talk about it and so thankful that you're doing the uh, documentary and then you're going into the other one in the next couple of months and you're going into small groups. After revival, I want you to really pray and I want you to work on that. My wife's going to be working on a, a thing with ministers' wives and it'll be happening somewhere around the last Monday or Tuesday this month. I told our pastors that I met with on Thursday, I said, encourage your wives to be a part. Do everything you can to clear their calendar. Take care of the kids. Do whatever you got to do to get them there. One of the things that the pastors uh, have told me, said, look, we hadn't had anything for our wives. My wife has always loved women's ministry. And I said, baby, going into this new role, I want you to think about doing something for pastor's wives, minister's wives. And so she is. Listen, guys and ladies, we're better together as we grow together. We, we need to sharpen one another. I've been blessed by some of you men when you stop and you tell me your story and and I've heard some of you ladies tell you, man, it, I go home full. I mean, I, I have to, it takes me a while to settle down. And, and you bless me. I told you today, y'all have richly, richly blessed me this weekend. I've been greatly blessed. But when you look at the Word of God and you begin to just think about what it says that in, in Hebrews, it said, did you catch it? That you and I are to stimulate, stimulate one another, provoke one another, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another, so one lady sharpens another. That we're living, we're serving, that we're doing what God has called us to do. The Word of God, just live it. Just be it. You know, I, let, me, let me just inject this. Somebody needs to hear this. You guys, if you're not reading Proverbs every day, you ought to be. Today's the 14th day of, uh, of August. You ought to be in the 14th chapter of Proverbs today. You ought to read it every single day. You can read Proverbs through in one month. You know that. And I'm telling you, God will implant it in your heart, guys, and God will do you a work in your life like you've never seen before. It's easy. Pick your Bible up and read it. Tomorrow, read the 15th chapter of Proverbs. Watch what God does. We think about revival. We think about coming together and, and doing what God calls us to be, that, that we come together in harmony. We are doing different things, but we come together in harmony. We break bread together. I, I showed you that passage of Scripture and just what was taking place from house to house, breaking bread together, praying together, um, just, just working off of one another. That's the church, folks. Invite folks in. Let them see that. Watch what God does. Meet somebody's need. Start looking for that. By the way, where were they meeting? Where did, where did they start meeting? In the houses. They had been where? In the temple. How, why did they get to the houses? Were they welcome in the temple? They started serving the Lord. They moved out of the temple. They wasn't welcome in the temple. They didn't believe in the Messiah. They still don't believe in the Messiah as far as the Jews. And then they had to move into the houses, and they began to break bread together. What better place to start than on your back porch? Do it together with another couple. Man, our senior adults usually are good at that. Big old pound cake, hot coffee. Cake comes out of the oven. You can smell it a mile down the road. Invite somebody to come. Man, pots of jambalaya. <laughs> wow, what a time. Take that and just apply it. Man, y'all done a great job of that. Just take it now and apply it to the community. Make it happen. Watch what God really wants to do. Look outward. These folks were willing to do whatever it took. They were kicked out of the synagogue, kicked out of the temple, all of that kind of stuff, but they began to move forward. We need each other. We, young people, you need each other. I, I'm telling you, I'm going to tell you again, one of the greatest blessings I've had since Friday is when I've seen all you guys here. It just don't happen. 
They just don't. And, and it's blessed me from that standpoint to, to just see that. And, uh, and then you begin to just learn to serve one another. I told you, Pastor, before we, we prayed before we came in tonight, and I just want to tell you, what I saw this weekend, you men coming around and cleaning tables and you ladies coming by and stacking up plates and making it happen and just serving others, just, just coming and, and doing it. Not everybody does that. What a, what a blessing. What, what a touch from God. And, and what a testimony to somebody who walks in who's never seen the church operate in that manner. Somebody comes up and takes their plate and goes and dunks it. Young people. See, they learn from you. I know at least two or three young people that came around and picked up plates. And see, the church takes on its personality of its pastor, especially after he's been here five years or more. And then the leadership speaks into it, and it goes from there, and it becomes contagious. And we become the church. And we mature. And we teach one another how to love and how to do what God has called us to be and how to do it together. How to do it together. How to harmonize and to make it happen. I want to ask you, are you mature? Are you maturing in your walk? Are you following the Lord Jesus Christ? See, an association of churches, we're better together, all 40 of us. Pastor's already told me, he said, man, we're interested in helping somebody with BBS next year. You can count on it. It's going to happen. My prayer is you start praying now that those 14 churches that didn't have BBS last year, this year, that we'll all have them next year. You know, um, New Prospect hadn't had a BBS in three years. They had one this year. They had three salvations. Praise God for that. Praise God for that and investing and, and watch what God will do in the midst of that. We're better together with Jesus. We're better together as we mature. That's what revival's all about. And then here's the deal. We'll always be better together in reaching the nations. One person can't do it. One person can't do it. I didn't ask Robin and Tim, but the folks we work with in Africa, I had a pastor tell me one time on the coast, He said, don't ask me to go to Africa. He said, I'm going to send my money. And I told the missionary that. I said, look, uh," called his name. I said, he told us don't ask him to go again. He's going to send money. And here's what the missionary said. He said, you can send all the money you want to, but we don't have the people we can't do anything with. Think about it. He said, we need bodies. We need bodies. The money doesn't get it done. (laughs) The money helps, and it's needed, but we need bodies. And I'm going to tell you, it's nothing like, listen, it's not, nothing like where you're in Malaysia, Tim, and then we're there, Robin, and then we're sharing, we're sharing their story. It's nothing like being in Thailand. We were there after the tsunami in Phuket. It's nothing like being in the jungles of Africa. I've been in the Congo. I've been in Sudan. It's nothing like Let me just take a moment and tell you. Some years ago, we were there, and Selena and them had gone on a, they'd gone out into another village, and I didn't go with them that day. And They came back, and they said, boy, we had a different encounter today. So what was it? They said, we had a little girl. When we got to the village, they told us that she would come around at some point. She was 12 years old. And her grandfather was a witch doctor. And the, the, the village folks told him, said, you're going to see this little girl. Her name is Nassim. And you're going to see Nassim come at some point, and, and she's demon-possessed because her dad has cast demons, or her granddad has cast demons into her. And Selena were, and then were there, and they were working, and sooner or later, Nassim come in, and she caused a, a commotion. And, and, and I may not tell the story exactly right, but, but she was just calling all kinds of commotion, and she fell out, and, and they began to pray over her. Our team began to pray over her. One of our men began to lead, and Selena and them, and, and they were all there praying over Nassim, and, and her body went limp. And after a few minutes, Nassim got up, and she left. 
The next morning when we went back and I seen Kim and she was normal. We went about our regular routine and we did all of our activities and all that and we left. About four years ago, if I had my phone, I'd show you a picture. I'm preaching out on the islands of Lake Victoria. And they were doing worship and, and you've never seen worship like you've seen in Africa. Uh, amazing what they do. And I'm, and, and I'm watching this, this young lady. Her, she's dressed in a, a bright blue and pink dress and just a beautiful girl, and they're praising the Lord. I get up and preach, my translator, and we get done, give the invitation, and, and everything's over, and I'm standing there, and this lady comes up in this blue dress and, and pink, blue and pink dress. And she said, Pastor, you don't know who I am, do you? And I said, no, I don't. She had a little boy in her hand. She said, this is my little boy, and I'm not seen. She said, your wife and your team prayed over me a number of years ago. And I was delivered from the demons that had hold of my life. And she said, now I'm the worship leader. I'm the worship leader at this church. I'm going to tell you, we do it better together. And God needs people like you and like me, like these young people who are willing to go and just do it together. And I'm sure Tim and Robin and others and some of you that have been on trips, you can tell one story after another where you go to Kentucky, whether you go to West Virginia. That, that's just one. I, I could tell you so many. I can tell you stories about the Congo. Uh, I can remember making jokes of the pygmies in yesteryears. But when you wind and you drive and you get up there and you find those pygmies, and they're the last hunter-gatherers, and you go to their little huts. It's not much bigger than an organ, and they're not but about this tall. And they died at an early age because they, they, they age so quickly. And you, you minister to them, and you see what's going on in their life, and they literally eat leaves, and they eat rats, and they eat, uh, they got little traps that they make, and, and you see all of that. And then you're able to tell them about a life-changing Jesus. It changes our telling you you were better together with Jesus. We're better together as we mature, and we're certainly better together in reaching others. And God's got his hand on you. God, God's got his fingerprint on your life. And the Holy Spirit of God wants to move in your life like he never has before. I want to challenge you, church, to reach beyond yourself. God, help me. To see the nations. God, help me to see the person next door. Be prepared for a move of God. Don't let it stop tonight. You begin praying tonight for tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday and then next weekend. God, move. God, I want to see. God, I want to be prepared for a movement of God. And you line up horizontally and vertically with the Lord. Horizontally with people and vertically with your relationship with God. And you watch what God will do. I want to ask you the question that I asked you when we started. Are you where God wants you to be? Right now. Right now. Are, are you where God wants you to be? If not, why? Is Jesus in full control of your life? If not, why? What are you holding back on? Does the world around you know that Jesus is real to you? Do they? Does a, does a family know? Do your best friends know that Jesus is Lord of your life? There's no plan B. God set the plan, and there's no plan B. If we don't do it, who's going to do it? What does the Word of God say? If we don't tell them, how are they going to hear? If we don't go, how are they going to hear? So I ask you tonight, as we close this service, are you where God wants you to be in your life? Is he real to you? Is he Savior and Lord? If you die tonight, if you pull out when you go out on Zetus Road and you get smacked and you enter into eternity, are you ready to meet Jesus? Are you? His bowed eyes closed.
So our sweet lady comes and just begins to play. Just a moment, Brother Chad's going to be down front. And if your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, will you commit to be involved with the Lord Jesus in the day-to-day basis of your life? Maybe tonight you're not involved in a a men's group or a women's group. Would you say tonight, God, I I commit myself, I'm going to get there. And will you start? Maybe it's something you need to talk to Brother Chad about and you start your own. Maybe, Maybe you want to do a coffee group at PJ's. I don't know. But I believe the Holy Spirit of God moving in this place right now is giving some dictation to men and women and young ladies and young men about what steps need to be taken in your life, in your family, in your home, and ultimately in friendship to be the people you need to be. You're never too old. There's no retirement with God. The Bible says don't don't let people look down on you because you're young. Man, we've got six years old kids that are maturing and, and, and some of them are more mature than our 20-year-olds or 30 or 40. Think about where you are. Do you know Jesus? I'm talking about really knowing. Is he Lord of your life? If he's not tonight, you got an opportunity to say, okay, God, I get it, and I give up, Lord. God, I want you to have me. God, take all of me. Take all of me, God. I want you to have me. Forgive me of my sin, God. I want to be the man or the woman, the young person you need me to be. There's a lady in the place you're holding back. There's some places in your life that you've been holding on to. God, you can't have this. Will you give it up for him tonight? So, Lord, here am I. God, I want to walk with you. Maybe there's some leaders in this church, and you've taken a back seat. You said, let somebody else do it. Let somebody else go. Let somebody else be. Let somebody else. Let somebody else. And under the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God, you know that you need to get back where you need to be. So right now, you got opportunity. Maybe, again, there's some families. This altar is going to be open. And you're coming, and you're just rejoicing because of the hand of God upon your life. I want you to be free tonight. I want you to be free in this first part of this invitation. I'm going to lead us in prayer. Brother Chad's going to be down front. And then I pray. Maybe you want to just come tonight and kneel at the altar of God. If you're one of those that need to get right with Jesus, you come. There's somebody tonight you need to rededicate your life. You can't rededicate what you hadn't already had. So you got to know him. Can't rededicate space. You got to know him. The relationship's what counts. It's what revival's all about. So what you going to do with it? What you going to do with it? God, in the name of Jesus, we are before you. And I pray, God, you'd find us faithful. I pray, almighty God, that we'd move right now in accordance to the will and the power of the Holy Spirit of God, that you would have your way. In Christ's name, you stand with us.